Fabrice David, Fabrice David. One moment. The title is. Uh, Buongiorno. Oh, <laughs> in Italiano. <laughs> Grazie. Dai. Son of uh, uh, the thunder about the ball lightning. Thanks. Thank you. Of course, I choose the title. Uh, as a tribute for the beloved uh, disciple of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's, this title shows that uh, faith must go uh, with science, and there is no opposition with, between faith and science. Well, since century, observers have described the appearance of strange luminous sphere during total storm. The sphere appears usually after lightning. These phenomena have been classif classified under the, the, the term of ball lightning. The luminous sphere are usually less than one meter in diameter. They can affect human and sudden death from contact with ball lightning have been Report. Ball lightning is a part of pop culture. By lightning can pass through glass window or enter the interior of metal cabin of plane. The ball lightning can uh, sometimes melt metal and other time pass through paper curtains without in igniting them. It is not known whether it is a single phenomenon or a series of phenomena that are of different nature. Of how to explain this phenomenon, how to find useful application for mankind, I will try to give you some answer during this presentation. There is a more than 100 scientific theories to explain by law ball lightning, don't be afraid. I am not going to make an exhaustive bibliography. But uh, this phenomenon was uh, even denied by a part of the academic world. Many believe that ball lightning was due to retinal persistence of the intense light emitted by the impact of lightning on the ground. Uh, I have twice witnessed the, the fall of uh, ni lightning, nearby myself, and uh, I can tell you that the noise you hear does not sound that the classical uh, uh, hum of the thunder in the uh, far view, but it's rather like a very loud banging of a whip uh, on, the, on the ear, and it is very impressive. Well, I only quote. Okay. I will only quote uh, some hypotheses. The classical hypothesis, uh, chemical hypothesis, uh, about lightning will be a silicon sphere uh, in combustion in the air. Uh, other researchers said uh, there is a chemical uh, storage of um, the energy in an uh, excited state of oxygen. Uh, Professor Ratis in Russia proposed uh, a way of collective de excitation of rare radioactive atoms present in the air. It's a kind of uh, 3D radioactive laser. Ratis is a member of uh, the Academy of Science of Russia. Uh, recently, Torkagin uh, explained by lightning, by self-focusing of light, by, by a nonlinear effect. Uh, some researchers propose the hypothesis of an uh, antimatter meteorite. Uh, the hypothesis of Nobel Prize Kapitsa in Russia is uh, explained by lighting by the interaction of uh, plasma and a microwave. And uh, this hypothesis received partial confirmation by uh, Kopekin in Russia. It is uh, the first experimental de device of uh, Kopekin. It is in uh, 
in his home, in his personal laboratory, you can see one Tesla coil, another Tesla coil, the excitation, and the, the two Tesla coils are of different size, so they, they, they don't uh, resonate at the same frequency. And in the dark, when the Tesla coils are, are um, energized, it's possible to see little sphere in the plasma. So, you know, the, the Russian like a big machine, and it is uh, the, Kopi the second Kopaikin device built in a nuclear research center in Russia. One Tesla coil, another Tesla coil, and you can see a classical Kokov Walton accelerator in the back. It is probably uh, Kurchatov Institute in Russia. And in the dark, it is possible to see a uh, ball uh, inside the, the spark. But during the, the thunderstorm, there is no microwave. microwave. Uh, there is another idea. Ken Schulden, Ken Schulden proposed a shell made of electrons associated by a collective interaction. He calls this the sphere electron validum. Orsco proposed a model made of nested, nested sphere of electron and proton. Uh, one of the most realistic hypotheses is that of plasmoid. The phenomena known today as plasmoid have been uh, described for many years, notably by, by the great Tesla during uh, his uh, experiment at uh, Colorado Spring. But the word plasmoid has been coined by uh, Winston Bostick. For warm, a plasmoid is a ma plasma magnetic entity. He said the experimental observation suggests that the plasma travel even in field free, uh, in field free space, not at an, amorph an amorphous blob, but at a structure called a plasmoid, whose form is determined by the magnetic field it, carry, it carries with itself. Excuse my, excuse my disastrous English. Please excuse my disastrous English accent. Uh, the term plasmoid for the Russian is a scientific name for ball lightning. There are two, two types of plasmoid. The siphon plasmoid, there is a current, an electric current <coughs> inside, and this current made, make a magnetic field outside. <coughs> Excuse me, and the law of Maxwell uh, made that uh, when the currents uh, uh, diminish, there is an induction of a magnetic field, so there is a, a stabilization for uh, of this object during some seconds, a certain time. <coughs> there is another class of plasmoid <coughs> called coffee plasmoid, current out, field in, field inside, an electrical current outside, and a strong magnetic field inside. And it is possible to show that uh, this uh, structure is also stable during <coughs> a certain time. The team of Vlasom in Russia reported the creation of plasmoid by passing a strong current through, through a specially shaped coal. This coal is made of thin wire, and the wire is pulverized by discharging a strong high voltage capacitor through it. So the author attempted to recreate plasmoid using Vlasov's coils of various shapes. This is a Vlasov coil. Uh, it's made with a very thin copper or palladium wire. This is a, a blast of coal. Uh, the diameter is uh, uh, three centimeters, so it's a very thin uh, coil of uh, copper. And if we discharge a strong 
battery of capacitor. Capacitor uh, between these coils, there is a strong magnetic field inside, the capacitor explodes, became a plasma, and we can see, uh, we could see a, a little sphere during only a fraction of a second. Here it's a bigger, uh, it's in, in my lab, it's a bigger uh, Vlasov coil. I use a, a styrofoam uh, torus to try to mold the discharge. It's the beginning of the discharge and it's the end of the discharge. The, but uh, with the capacitor I used, I was not uh, able to build stable plasmoid. I try also to make plasmoid with uh, palladium wire charged with uh, deuterium to see if uh, uh, it, w it was possible to make the cold fusion or lukewarm fusion. It's not totally cold, of course. It is a device used to charge the palladium uh, Vlasov coil with uh, deuterium. It is a uh, uh, platinum anode. The Vlasov coil of thin palladium uh, uh, wire. The uh, EV water. The palladium inside. Here it's uh, the, the device. It's uh, a piece of silver and a uh, paraffin block to, to see if there is a neutron. And it's after the, the shot, there is a, a, a little uh, sphere. I was not able to, to, to make a beautiful uh, photograph. It's very, very, uh, very quick. But to be frank, I d with this experiment, using a blast of coal, I uh, don't see neutron. So no clear re replication of the ball lightning production. To be stable, plasmoid need probably a huge voltage and current produced by the discharge of the biggest bank of capacitors. So it is not, blast of co coil is not, uh, uh, for the moment, a, a, a good way to fusion. But the situation changed completely 50 years ago when a Russian researcher managed to reproductively make luminous plasmoid, luminous spheroid, which have all the characteristics of ball lightning. It's my friend, the Dr. Shabanov, and he is making what is called a plasmoid. And you know, you, you see, it's in, in, he works in his office, not in a lab. It's very dangerous because under the, the, his desk, there is a big bang of uh, high voltage capacitor. He, he, he takes this capacitor from uh, the train, the, the, uh, the company of the train, uh, the, of the railway in, in Russia. Uh, and he succeeded very uh, with a high reproducibility to make this ball of light. And the device used is very simple. A high voltage generator, a big capacitor, and a, uh, a switch, a salad bowl full of water, a, an anode made of copper, and a cathode made of uh, a little tube of um, glass with little piece of graphite or copper inside. And when the switch, the switch is on, there is a discharge be between the anode and the liquid. And it is possible to see a sort of luminous mushroom that our uh, Russian co friend call plasmoid. It's the doctor Shabanov with a plasmoid, you know. So the system is very simple. Uh, a bowl of water, a circular, circular anode. The switch is, his switch is only a, a, a stick of plastic. And uh, of course, it's very dangerous, very dangerous, because it, 
the contact of, uh, with the bank of capacitors uh, produce uh, the, the death uh, without uh, any, uh, any dupe. But the Russian are like this. Uh, they, are, they make bold hypotheses on bold experiments. Another picture. And it's very strange. There is uh, some uh, uh, wave after the desearch, but the wave don't. The origin of the wave is not the, the cathode, but the origin of the wave is the wall of the, uh, the recipient. So, uh, 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 an explanation of uh, ball lightning must take into account this observation. This is a by li lightning. So, in the recent years, the, the, the number of publications has increased uh, in a prestigious organization, Max Planck Institute, US, US Navy. Uh, Laboratories, American University, Russian Academy of Science, Yoffe Institute, Kurchatov Institute. A Russian friend inherited from the Soviet uh, time a different way of doing science. Even among, among uh, academics, there is no taboo, taboo subject. The fatal notion of voodoo science is unknown in Russia, and researchers were free to choose new research of topics that will seem uh, strange of or incongruous in the West. In the field of low energy nuclear reaction, we must cut the remarkable world works of uh, Yuri ba the late, of course, uh, uh, the late uh, Yuri Bazutov, Alexander Karabut, Vladimir Vidovsky, Alexander Karab Parkomov, and uh, Ka Katya Belusova. I am forgetting the, the name of many Russian researchers who deserve to be caught, such, such uh, as uh, Professor Philip Kanareff, who did, uh, who did uh, research about the, the improving of water electrolysis at Krasnodar University. Many of the scientists are now working with extremely modest financial means. They are often forced to make their own experimental equipment, but it returns, they can work in a an atmosphere of uh, remarkable academic freedom. Uh, Shabadov plasmoids have been reproduced by many teams many team, uh, around the world, including uh, Max Planck Institute, uh, Air Force, uh, University of uh, Illinois, uh, Los Alamos. There is a lot of study with uh, spectroscopy, uh, uh, plasma, plasma diagnosis, and very, very, uh, very uh, lot of results but contradictory result. Some author, some author measure uh, uh, high temperature inside, other author measure low temperature is inside the, the luminous ball. So uh, there is a need for an explanation in, uh, of this phenomenon. It is the beginning of the formation of the Berlin thing. There is a, a sort of creeping desert uh, in the surface of the, of the water, and at, at the end, there is a, a sort of a luminous mushroom and a, then a ball. Then a luminous ball during uh, one, two, three seconds. Uh, this is my experiment, my uh, experimental uh, device. Uh, first, I don't want to, to, to be uh, electrocuted, so, so I, I try to improve the security of the, of the device. Uh, a big capacitor. Here, I, uh, I had a key. It's a safety key uh, to uh, uh, ground all the, disposit all the, the, the device uh, after uh, uh, each experiment to, to be sure that uh, it's possible to, to, to change uh, the, the ball. I made the ball, I made recipient uh, container of different size. Uh, and uh, a lucid uh, polymethyl metacrylate shield to avoid uh, uh, accident. And I use, of course, um, something to uh, uh, an helmet to protect my ear. I use a pedal to as a switch.
to control the, the switch uh, at distance. And uh, I use many uh, type of uh, removable container. It's possible to plug the, the container. So there is an, an anode and a cathode. <laughs> and the solution is tap water or copper uh, sulfate uh, solution, but uh, the best result are obtained with tap water. It's, uh, I use two types of capacitor, commercial capacitor of uh, uh, two, um, two battery of uh, uh, 200 uh, microfarad, and uh, I made special uh, uh, capacitor of uh, uh, 100 microfarad, but with very low inductance. I build a, a winding machine to, to make myself the high voltage capacitor. So when closing the circuit, there is first a, a creeping water film uh, coming from the cathode. And uh, the, the, strong, uh, the strong electric field causes the water to, to creep to, to, uh, and to, to touch uh, the, uh, the water, the solution in the, in the main container. So when the, the, the contact is, is made, there is an arc discharge. It is uh, I have photoshopped this, uh, this picture to, 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 uh, to enlighten uh, to the, the form of the discharge. There is a, a, a sort of umbrella. And what is causing the form of the bubble, in my opinion, it is the magneto-hydrodynamic force. There is the Laplace force, who blow the arc to form a sort of umbrella by the classical uh, um, uh, rule of the three fingers. And the plasma umbrella is blown by its own magnetic field. And at the end of the discharge, the liquid is pulled away, it, it is sucked by the strong electric field at, the, at this place. So the water, the solution climb one or two centimeters, and after the interruption of the discharge, the water fall, fall, fall down, and it is what produces this strange centripetal wave. To, in order to estimate the density of the gas, Inside the plasma, I made uh, what I call pseudo Schlieren experiment. Schlieren is a, it's a uh, classical uh, optical uh, technique used in, uh, to, to diagnostic the plasma uh, and the shock wave. I use a very uh, an arc lamp called so an all device called point -o -lit, point -o -lit lamp, a screen. And uh, the point lit lamp produces a very uh, strong um, white uh, light. On, on the screen, I can see the uh, shadow of the luminous object. And by, compa by comparison with um, helium, uh, with uh, carbon dioxide, uh, I am able to, to, um, to say that the density inside the luminous object is uh, around the density of helium, perhaps uh, under the density of helium. So uh, the luminous object have also paradoxical property. They are stopped by sheet of paper without uh, setting them on fire, but in other conditions, they, can, they could make, uh, melt uh, metal wi wire. So we must explain this fact. Uh, more strange, in a more strange way, Shabadov and collaborators show that uh, when using a very classical helium neon laser, the laser seems to attract the plasmoid. It's very strange because uh, the laser is, is very, very feeble. It's like a, 
uh, a pointer, some, some milliwatts. So we, c we must explain this fact. Uh, I use a big electromagnet and uh, I pass the, the Gachina uh, luminous object uh, near the, the, pla the, the point of uh, maximum magnetic field. And I, I saw that uh, there is not a, a great action of magnetic field. It's, it's very strange. It, if uh, the, the Gachina plasmoid are uh, uh, really plasmoid. So, my hypothesis is that it's not a, that the ball, ball lightning, an artificial ball lightning, and probably natural ball lightning are not plasmoid, but simply bubble of hydrogen in ascension very pure, pure hydrogen, and there is a, a steady and, um, uh, combustion producing. It's a flame, it's a spherical uh, flame. It's a chemical, chemical process, in fact. So it's not an uh, exotic plasmoid. Uh, the explanation is more simple. And it's possible to, 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 to prove this with laser. Uh, the luminous, luminous object uh, change the direction of laser. Of course, I use a, a laser like this, and I pass the, 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 the luminous ball uh, in the laser, and at 10 meters, I could see that the luminous ball act at uh, divergent, divergent lengths. So, it is probably a bubble of hydrogen. Uh, conclusion, the surprising observation led us to formulate a new hypothesis. The Gachina, Gachina plasmoid will not be plasmoid in the sense of Bostic, but could simply be, be very pure hydrogen bubble in ascension. In the air, the, this bubble will be consumed in contact with oxygen, and the light observed will be only the result of the flame caused by the combustion of hydrogen stained by the metal ion contained on the solution. But there is a question. First, omit something useful for mankind. And when during classical electrolysis, there is at the cathode hydrogen and the, at the anode oxygen. In our, exp in our experiment, where is the oxygen? It's a great question. So I made uh, other uh, experiment. I don't. Uh, I I will uh, conclude. In my opinion, there is not at the anode there is not the classical this classical reaction. There is a new reaction. I propose the term shock electrolysis. At the anode, there is this uh, this. Uh, there is this uh, reaction in the container, hydrogen at the cathode and at the anode formation of uh, peroxide of oxygen. And this peroxide of oxygen stay in the solution. I try to prove the, um, that peroxide of hydrogen was in this solution. So what is the utility? First, it is possible to make an electrolysis which produce only hydrogen, high purity hydrogen, and there is a great technical problem when we try to um, store the energy in the form of hydrogen. Because during the electrolysis, at the cathode and at the anode, there is a little wall of bubble, this phenomenon is uh, this phenomenon is called polarization, and polarization uh, uh, made that it is not possible to uh, to uh, to get a yield superior to 40 percent in the transformation of electricity 
in nitrogen. And it is a great problem because uh, if we, we, we want to, to make the society, uh, the, the, if we want to enter the hydrogen era, we must uh, uh, find a new way to, uh, to store the uh, electrical energy in the form of hydrogen. But with a plasmoid, there is no polarization because uh, the electrolysis is made between a, a, a gaseous cathode. Uh, it's a classical electrolysis. If we uh, try to, uh, to uh, rise the voltage, we don't uh, get a higher yield. We get simply light and uh, bubble and noise, but uh, the yield falls to ridicule value. It's a wenelt volaston effect, and this effect is used uh, by our colleague who uh, tried to reproduce the Mizuno experiment of cold fusion. I will make the conclusion. Please notice that your uh, hypothesis will provide a credible explanation for the phenomenon of ball lightning, a lightning strike of negative polarity falling on the surface of a lake, a puddle, a marsh, or a, a wet surface, will produce a big bubble of hydrogen. Of course, there is not a, a magnetic force forces like in our experiment, but uh, with a big volume of hydrogen, uh, the expects could be spectacular. Conclusion, our results therefore suggest that the ball lightning, this mysterious phenomenon observed for centuries, could be, perhaps, at the base of a new process of storage of the electrical energy in the form of hydrogen and could allow the fast development of the renewable energy of which the world is in urgent need in order, in order to manage the global warming. Thank you for your attention. Okay. Any questions? Presenta Alan Smith la presentazione. H2 pod localized hydrogen generation off grid H2, H2 pod sarà in inglese naturalmente in English <laughs> <laughs> yes I'm afraid it's in English but buongiorno <laughs> e buongiorno it's on? ok fine yes ok Può spegnere le luci in sala, per favore? Grazie. Hydrogen is a very fashionable topic at the moment. The European uh, governments are subsidizing hydrogen in Germany, in France, in Italy, because they're trying to build a hydrogen economy. But before I get into that, I'd like to just say something. People talk about green hydrogen blue hydrogen, gray hydrogen, black hydrogen. We all know hydrogen has no color. The terms are related to how it's produced. Green hydrogen, which is what I'm talking about today, is made from either renewables or in some sustainable way. Blue hydrogen, which is 95% of the hydrogen produced in the world at the moment, is made from methane gas by steam reforming. And it's not a particularly clean process, but I'm getting off track. So <clears throat> we're building a new hydrogen economy in Europe, but to me it looks dangerously like the old hydrogen economy, or the, the old normal economy, in the fact that the same companies, the gas companies, the oil companies, the electricity companies, are trying now to build vertical systems where they own both the means of production and the gas and, 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 and the equipment that produces it. Um, I was talking to uh, a guy from Iberdrola, a big uh, 
Spanish company, energy company, particularly in electricity. And Iberdrola said to me, they are only interested in vertical models because they want to sell their product. They want, they want to sell electricity. And green hydrogen in Europe at the moment means hydrogen made from the electrolysis of water. And this is only green if it's made using renewable electricity, electricity from solar, from wind, and so on. At the moment, it's not really so. So there is a problem. We're building a new hydrogen economy, but it's the same old chicken, but it's got different source. That's all. Um, so I was looking into the problems of this, uh, particularly because a friend of mine in England is an expert on, electrici on the electricity grid. And he pointed out to me the problems both with hydrogen as a, as a fuel source and with batteries for vehicles, electric vehicles. This hotel, for example, has got something like 100 car parking spaces. If all of those cars had batteries, then they would require quite a lot of charging points for the cars. Each one of those will be maybe 12 and a half kilowatts to supply electricity to recharge 100 cars. This hotel would need one and a half megawatts. Uh, which is not necessarily available on the grid. And the same is true of electrolyzers in many places that uh, I've been talking also with a company in Bristol who, have, who, who collect uh, the garbage. They are the éboyeurs, as they say in France. Yeah? Uh, they collect all the domestic garbage in Bristol. And they would want to change to hydrogen. Their diesel bill is phenomenal. Um, garbage trucks only do round about five kilometers, uh, one kilometer on a liter of diesel, because it's all slow speed, low gear, and lots of stopping and starting and stopping and starting. So they decided they would like to buy from Hyundai, who are actually manufacturing them, hydrogen trucks. But they would need a two megawatt electrolyzer. Uh, two megawatt demand on the grid to supply them with hydrogen. And they have been quoted a quarter of a million euros, approximately, to put the feed in. And the electrolyzer station is another eight million euros. So, <laughs> so they've decided to look around for some other possibility. So I came up with the idea of looking at some very old chemistry, which is the production of hydrogen from aluminium. Right, which is very simple. I'm sure that quite a few people here have done it using aluminium, perhaps powder or bits of aluminium, and caustic soda, sodium hydroxide, and this produces hydrogen. And also, if you've done it, you'll notice it produces a lot of heat. It's a very exothermic chemical reaction. And I thought, well, this is interesting. And I started looking at the hydrogen production. And that, then I realized, A, that sodium hydroxide is not the best catalyst. Uh, there are better. And also, the other problem is that the end product of turning that aluminum into another product and releasing the hydrogen is something called sodium aluminate, which is not a very useful uh, chemical at all. It's, it's used a little bit for uh, dyeing clothing for colouring clothes and so on, but it has a very small amount of use. Whereas if you use a different catalyst uh, and you organise the chemistry carefully, then you make hydrogen and sodium trihydrox uh, sorry aluminium trihydroxide and aluminium trihydroxide, uh, also known as just plain aluminium hydroxide Al2. OH3 is a very valuable compound and the economics are riveting because if you buy one ton of I use this kind of I'll just uh, show you something this is the kind of aluminium that I like to use in this process and this is not <laughs> it's this stuff and you can see this is, this is machine waste from, actually this came from uh, the 
Aston Martin factory in England, where they, where they machine aluminium engines. And this is very difficult to smelt. It's very difficult to recycle as metal. For a start, you can only put material like this into a cold furnace, because if you try and put it into a hot furnace, then it, it, it just all just flies up in the air like that. It's, it's very, very difficult. And also, they have to add a lot of sodium fluoride fluxes and salt and so on. And, it, and the, yield of, of <coughs> the yield of metal from this is around about 70%. And there is possibly, well, many, many tons produced by, this, by, by smelting this material of, of something called salt cake, which is a very noxious uh, slag product, which um, there's a place in England where there is a small valley, which is full of salt cake. It's got, they reckon it's got 10 to 15,000 tons of this aluminium slag, salt cake slag. And when it rains, you cannot even go anywhere near it because it gives off ammonia and hydrogen. It's very dangerous. It's become very dangerous. It's all, it has a big fence around it now. So there are clean ways of doing this. And in the laboratory, having worked on the catalysis, I built a plant, which as far as I know is the biggest one of its kind in the world. Toshiba built one, but theirs is a five litre system. And this is a 25 litre system. And this, this machine here will produce round about three kilos of aluminium a day. But the magic is, you get that one ton of scrap aluminium, <coughs> it makes you about 110 kilos of hydrogen so an 11% yield, but at the end of the process, you have 2.9 tonnes of aluminium hydroxide, which is worth probably five times as much as the scrap metal that you put in at the beginning. And all you've added to it is water. Yeah, so it's a bit like baking bread. You know the baker buys a bag of flour that maybe weighs 50 kilos, and he turns it into 200 kilos worth of loaves by adding water. I do just the same. I add water to the aluminium, make it into hydroxide, and uh, <coughs> the, the, the answer is a very green. The hydrogen is incredibly pure. I've run samples of this hydrogen through a mass spectrometer, and uh, the, the impurities are very low. It's perfect for fuel cells. It's perfect for almost any use, in fact. The impurities are measured in just a few parts per million, and there are no, there's nothing nasty in there, no, no carbon monoxide, no sulfur, no sulfides, and so on. So it's, it's a good product. Now, here we are. So this is a little bit about the history of the company, which is not necessarily interesting. I've been working on this for four years. In my heart, I'm a cold fusion experimenter but you can't run a cold fusion lab on hope. And it's been very difficult to raise much money for cold fusion. On the other hand, making hydrogen, people want to give you money. Yeah, and I, so it is my intention to, to fund the lab with this process and, and to do the cold fusion research as well as part of it. Now, it's always been important to us, by the way. Just look at the last sentence there. Every part of our work is designed to be as green as possible. In other words, we are, I'm only interested in doing chemistry that doesn't produce any toxic byproducts, that produces useful commercial items and adds value. It's based on the upcycling of materials. Yeah, you, you take something like this, which is pretty useless, and you turn it into something very useful, the kind of thing you could drive your car, you could power your car with or power, power a lorry. There is much debate, actually, about the, the best way to run this economy. Should we be using battery vehicles or should we be using hydrogen vehicles? There is a place for both. Batteries are very good for cars and small, small vehicles, but when you get to a big lorry, a, a 40 ton lorry, then it will probably need something like five or six tons of battery. And I'll overlook the fact that nobody really knows how to recycle a battery, the fact that they would also need charging from the grid. 
and so on. It's not practical. The, the, the freight hauliers, <coughs> the garbage companies, the waste collectors, they don't want to be running vehicles with, with six tons of dead weight on board. So hydrogen is good for heavy vehicles, batteries are good for cars. That seems to be how it is. There you are. There's a little about that argument there. Yeah, yeah. So hydrogen fuel cells, of course, are not necessarily going to end up any more expensive than batteries. And uh, they use much less in terms of precious raw material. Um, there is a shortage of materials to manufacture fuel cells at the moment. The membranes are in very short supply. <coughs> but, um, of course, as there is demand, those, those supply problems are overcome. And it says, as I say here, fleet operators, they need something uh, that, uh, where they can refuel their lorries quite soon. In other words, they're not connected to a charger for 24 hours and off the road. They need something faster than a battery system. And the whole fuel cell and electric drivetrain in, in a heavy truck weighs something like 700 or 800 kilos compared with maybe 6,000 kilos for a battery truck. It's a huge difference, and that difference is profitability for the carrier. So what we've, I've been working on designing is what I call the hydrogen pod, the H2 pod. Because it's off an off-grid system, the power demand to produce hydrogen is very low. The process is very exothermic, and so it produces a lot of heat. A ton of hydrogen, uh, sorry, a ton of aluminium, a ton of aluminium produces four megawatt hours of potential hydrogen energy. So that 110 kilos is, is worth four megawatt hours. But it also produces four megawatt hours of process heat, of exothermic heat from the reaction. So there is a good possibility to use this in district heating schemes and so on. And I must emphasize this again, it makes no demand on the grid. Because the grid, if, if Europe were to switch over to hydrogen, uh, there are a few problems. It would require two, terawatt, two terawatts of generation capacity to make all the hydrogen that, that Europe needs. Now, a terawatt, well, you may not <laughs> be clear in your head what a terawatt is. It's a big number. But the entire world production of electricity at the moment is around about 15 terawatts. So for Europe to add another two, <laughs> you can imagine how big a project that would be. So it's not really going to happen. Um, there's, there's some information there, I'm sure. I managed to read the Italian quite well. Um, <laughs> perhaps you can read the English. OK, I hope. So hydrogen can be produced at the point of demand. If you have a truck depot, uh, it doesn't matter where it is. It could be, uh, you know, it could be in a little town in the, in the middle of Umbria, it could, be a, it could be a small market town in central France, it could be anywhere. And uh, because Coca-Cola supply the fuel for this system, yeah, and they distribute it all over the world for nothing. It's free, yeah, you can pick it up in the street. Now, to go on from there, Oh, it's a little bit about how it works. I'd forgotten that slide was there. Never mind. You're welcome to, uh, to read that. There is nothing revolutionary about the chemistry. It's just been, it's a simple trick, but I just learned how to do it very well indeed, so that the products that come from it are very pure. And I've discovered a lot about hydrogen chemistry and, uh, and particularly a lot about aluminium chemistry in doing it because aluminium uh, is a very versatile material. Yeah? There's lots of things you can do with aluminium, I've discovered. Because this process produces hydrogen and exothermy, you can imagine that if you were to take a sealed reactor and run this chemistry inside a sealed reactor, the temperature will go very high. And in fact, it does. I've done it. So the temperature will go up to around about 
270 in the system I have, I can get the temperature up to 270 uh, centigrade and round about 15 bar. So the reactor is full of a mixture of steam and hydrogen. And of course, with that mixture, you could run a turbine, yeah, a rotary engine, and extract the, the, the energy, the kinetic energy from the steam. But after you've done that, you've still got the hydrogen, which you can use for anything you want. You could use it to make more steam if you like to run the turbine. So you can actually achieve, theoretically, it looks like you can do cogeneration using this chemistry at round about 65 or 70 percent efficiency, which is remarkable. It's as good as a Brayton Circle, a, a combined uh, phase turbine, the very best systems that we've got. And as I say, it's everywhere. There are a billion tons of aluminium in the world. And that's all the aluminium there is in cars, in windows, in, in cans, in, in, in foil for cooking, everything. One billion tons. America's official figure for landfilled aluminium, and a lot of it is this low value stuff that, that this chemistry is so good for, 2.4 million tons a year. In the EU, 27 countries, the figure is much the same. So between the EU and the USA, we are at the moment landfilling 5 million tons of aluminium metal, all of which could be used to make hydrogen. And more importantly, could be made to use aluminium hydroxide, made to make aluminium hydroxide and aluminium oxide. To make aluminium hydroxide, the raw material, the first raw material for manufacturing metallic aluminium, requires the mining of bauxite and bauxite clay. Uh, and it's mined in Europe, it's mined these days mostly in the Gulf and in China and Australia. And it's a very dirty business to make, to extract or refine, if, as they call it, to refine the hydroxide using something called the Bayer process. It requires large amounts of, of sodium hydroxide, steam heat, and so on. It's very polluting. And even the best grades of bauxite clay only have about 50% of aluminium hydroxide in them. Now, that residue from that process, the, the the toxic sludge, if you like, which is called red mud, is currently around about 150 million tons a year of red mud are being produced. And there are people who've worked on things you can do with it, different products you can make. But the problem is it's being produced in places where they have no capacity to recycle it. Um, uh, Fabrice was telling me yesterday about a place in France where they've been dumping it in the sea. There's a place in Italy, there's an Italian uh, bauxite business that's been dumping it in the Mediterranean, in a bay in the Mediterranean for many years. I think they've stopped production at the moment. But nevertheless, you see, what's going on? So if that five million tons of landfilled aluminium that I talked about in America and here was used to make aluminium hydroxide, not only would you have half a million tons of hydrogen, right, which is a lot of hydrogen, uh, and, and a huge amount of process heat, which could be used for all kinds of stuff, you would have, at the end of that, 15 million tons of aluminium hydroxide, right, which would prevent the mining of 30 million tons of bauxite clay. And the shipping around the world, it just goes on, yes. And, and also prevent the production of something like 20 million tons of CO2, of carbon dioxide. 20 million tons. Yes? Okay. okay. Oh, thank you. Okay. I'll get on with it. Sorry, you've got me on my favourite topic at the moment here. I'm hard to stop. <laughs> okay, this is uh, just a little view of how it might work in the circular economy. You see there's, there's people at the top left here, you've got people producing waste, and it goes to a collection point, it gets processed in the, in the H2 pod, and then it 
makes heat, it makes hydrogen, and also it makes stuff that can be cleanly recycled back into aluminium, into, back into metallic aluminium. So it's not lost. And, and this is the, what I call the non-preferred aluminium, the stuff nobody wants. This just tells you what it's unique about it, but I've already told you that, so <laughs> we'll go on. So there you are, you see the, the, the emphasis on modular, in other words, you can build this machine any size, that you can put it anywhere you like. All you need is some clean water and a very small electricity supply, maybe 20 or 30 kilowatts, not two or three megawatts, just 20 or 30 kilowatts will run a big plant. And uh, of course, the plant has the ability to make its own energy when it's running. So it's very small infrastructure requirement. It produces, if you run it with a fuel cell, uh, it produces a lot of sterile hot water as well. Clean, sterile hot water from the fuel cell, uh, which in some places will be very valuable indeed, uh, especially for things like disaster relief and so on. But I don't know much about that business, the disaster relief that is. So at the moment we have characterized the process, we have developed paper designs for a big plant, uh, and we are looking at things like the grid, we're looking at the scrap metal industry, the people who collect the aluminium. Uh, we are talking to a couple of, com I'm talking to a company in Austria who are very interested in building this plant. And uh, it seems that the more people understand about the aluminium industry, the more interested they are in this process because they realize that it fills a gap, it fills a niche in the business. And um, so right now I'm trying to raise the, I don't know, three, four million euros to build the first big plant. And maybe this year uh, that will begin. I hope so, I hope so. But I think I've said enough. I'm very happy this is just about money. There you are. And it's a very profitable business, by the way. Um, I've had a good accountant looking at the figures and, and it is his opinion that the return on investment, in other words, if you spend four million euros building a plant, how long does it take to get the four million euros back? The answer is less than two, less than two years. Yeah, so the return on investment is very high. There we go. And we're looking at routes to market. The biggest obstacle at the moment is the nature of the whole business in that the people who produce the scrap metal, the people who collect the scrap metal, the aluminium, are mostly, some are big companies like Suez, but there are lots of relatively small businesses who you can talk to. At the moment, aluminium hydroxide and aluminium oxide are produced by huge global companies like Rio Tinto Zinc, like Iveris, and so on. And we have, I, I've managed to get a route to talk to somebody in Iveris, which is a, a global company. They employ, I think, 15,000 people. They have bauxite, a bauxite business and so on. They are very, they get it. They, they, they're interested. But to talk to somebody at Rio Tinto Zinc about something that disrupts their current business model, impossible. Absolutely impossible. And I've tried talking to Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola are not remotely interested in recycling. Not remotely. They have a director of sustainability. His job is to talk about sustainability, not to do anything about it. I've been right to the top in Savannah, Georgia, the HQ of, of Coca-Cola worldwide. Impossible. They're just not interested. They want to talk the talk, but they don't want to walk the walk. This is a little overview of the process, it's just a block diagram showing what goes on. And it shows 10 tons of input, and at the other end, if I remember correctly, and I certainly can't read it from here, it shows you how much of the hydroxide and the, and the heat and so on comes out of it. Yeah, so the, the hydroxide that this makes, by the way, is very interesting. It is very fine, uniform crystal structure, three to five microns in size, 
Um, and the crystals themselves are very crisp, very sharp, and apparently good for catalysts. Okay, I think we're there. If I say it's sustainable, you have to believe me. Are there any questions? If we have a moment for questions? We do? Yes. Okay. We have time for questions. Francesca. I just have uh, one curiosity. I, I lost what is the electrolyte you use to avoid the formation of aluminum uh, sodium uh, it, the, compound? The, the, um, it, it, there is no electrolyte because there is no electricity. It's a purely chemical. Yeah, 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 I see. And the catalyst. It's a secret. <laughs> it's a secret. <laughs> <laughs> it's a mixture. But it's a mixture. The second question is, uh, okay, I have a very short question. Uh, during the process to produce hydrogen, mm -hmm. you need to have some energy. Is it right? Uh, a to very small amount at the beginning. The, if you just put everything into a, 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 a reactor or a bucket or whatever, and leave it, then it would, the, the reaction will begin, but very slow. If you raise the temperature initially yeah. to about 65 centigrade, then the reaction becomes very fast. There's, there, it's very rate dependent, yeah? You reach 65 and it goes like that. And so that's a very small amount. Um, okay. Typically, to, to make that three tons of hydrogen, in, uh, uh, sorry, three kilos of hydrogen, which is worth something like, has a potential energy of 120 kilowatts. Uh, the system in my lab, we use five or six kilowatt hours to do that. So okay. the COP is 20 okay. in a big, big plant, 50 or 60. Okay, thank yeah. you. Okay, sorry, Francesca, yes. I, I will understand that your catalyst is a secret. <laughs> Obviously, your catalyst. Yes. Uh, but um, there is some um, some uh, problems for the recycling the catalyst. Of recovering it. Re recycling the catalyst can be. Oh, some oh, sure. I don't think I don't think it will survive uh, modern examination. No, of course not. I can never keep it a secret for very long. Right now, I don't want to talk about it too much, but I do understand that within, uh, build, if we build a plant within 12 months, then somebody else would be wanting to do it too. So the, it's the old story, be first, be fastest, be the best, yeah, and run good customer service, Francesco, answer questions immediately. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay. Other questions? No. I, I do actually, ha I have filed patents for the plant, uh, also for cogeneration, the, the high pressure system I talked about. Um, I've filing patents, uh, also filed a patent for the zero CO2 manufacture of aluminium oxide, which is, which is calcined, in other words, very strongly heated in a furnace, aluminium hydroxide. So you use the aluminium, to make aluminium hydroxide and use the hydrogen to transform that into, uh, into aluminium oxide. This, that's a patentable process. And uh, the other one is the idea, um, I'm currently writing a patent for the idea that a waste company who does smelting, somebody who runs a smelter, for example, to remelt aluminium, could use this very, bad and boring part of, of their inlet stream, the least profitable, the most polluting, the most difficult as far as they're concerned, they could use that 20% or so of their input stream of raw material to smelt the, to make hydrogen to smelt the rest and, and then sell the hydroxide at a profit. So suddenly they're not buying methane from the grid to run their furnace, they're using the raw material that they're buying and they're selling the end product which is this stuff, by the way. I, I, I got this through Customs, okay. They're very lax at the moment. Custom, all this white powder, I just got it through Customs. They never even asked me. <laughs> and that's, that's the end product. This is, this is clean hydroxide. Yes? Uh, I Another one. Uh, 
Um, if you um, produce some uh, pollution of uh, dioxin or some... Uh, no, 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 not at all. No, po no poison? Nothing, no poison. Ah, okay, no poison. okay, thank you. Okay, let's thank you again, uh, Alan. Yeah, thank you. Applauso. Now is the time for Bill. Presentation. Those, those of, of you who've known me for 25 odd years <laughs> know that I have this passion for uh, unusual and exotic theories. And uh, um, the title of this talk is um, The Theory of the uh, Neutral Exotic Particles as Catalysts for Cold Fusion. And I'm hoping, though I probably won't be able to persuade you, that uh, this is going to turn out to be a comprehensive um, solution to all cold fusion phenomena. When I say all, let's say 80%, let's be modest, because maybe not all the, uh, um, the observations are entirely correct. I have to say that I'm, I'm very emotional being back at the, the podium and this wonderful um, conference hall, because a year ago I was, um, together with, uh, with Claudio, we, we, we were chairing the ICCF 22, and it's a real pleasure to be back here. But I have to say also, that uh, my pleasure, my emotion, is tempered slightly um, because just um, less than two weeks ago, our colleague uh, Gino, who was president at ICCF 22, died at his home in Chennai in India. He was a wonderful man, a good friend, a brilliant scientist, and a very open-minded um, uh, researcher. He was, for, for example, uh, and, with, and with his group at uh, Bark in, in uh, Mom, Mumbai, uh, the discoverer of that, for example, that neutrons and tritium could be formed with light hydrogen. And I don't think anybody in the, in the last 30 years has discovered how this could, could come about. So uh, he posed a problem. I don't know if applause is appropriate for someone who's just died. <laughs> Maybe a moment of silence would be better. But let's, let's go on, because we haven't got a lot of time. I think he was 75, wasn't he? Well, 80, 80 was it? Oh, sorry, I beg your pardon. Him. Yes, I'm, I'm confused with... So, after 30 years, Few of any models attempting to explain condensed matter nuclear science or LENA have achieved acceptance other than the original proponent. In other words, for every model, we have one person who says, this is the model. And I think that's really bad, appalling actually, because science usually proceeds a lot faster than this. We have very few experiments which, were set, up, which set out to test theories and we have very few theories which explain exactly what they predict, so it's a vicious circle. So um, when I present uh, this um, theory of exotic neutral particles, I'm going to go out of my way to emphasize the predictions it makes and compare those predictions with what we already know and what we don't know yet. How do we go about testing theories? Well, uh, historically, we've used things like um, uh, mass spectroscopy, um, maybe uh, um, spectra, uh, maybe um, chemistry, but these are not very sensitive methods. Nuclear measurements are far, far more sensitive. They also have the advantage of giving, an, uh, in many cases, uh, an instantaneous, on, uh, let's say, um, real-time result. So if for, if, for example, you're mod monitoring gamma rays, you could, you could test the effect of temperature very, very quickly and see if the, the gamma ray spectrum changes with temperature or with pressure or with the uh, d uh, immediate addition of some new element in, the, in a gas stream or something like that. In, in, I'm particularly fond of um, gamma spectroscopy because it not only tells you the energy of the, uh, of the gamma ray, but also the intensity um, from, from the, rate, the rate of counting, and you can compare that 
eventually with the uh, excess heat. And then you can, if it's a, a case of uh, a decay, a radioactive decay, you can measure the half-life. And these um, three things combined can probably identify the isotope. And if you identify the isotope, you probably identify the reaction. But we are very far from identifying uh, the, the underlying cold fusion reactions. So how do we go about testing theories? Now, it seems rather strange that I'm talking about my theory. I want to talk about gen generically uh, testing theories. This is because we have, you can, a theory will only win out if you, can, if you can show it is better than any other theory. That's just the way science proceeds. So I think it's appropriate to, to make these comparisons. Anyway, I suggest that an overwhelming observation uh, with, that we see in cold fusion is the absence of penetrating radiation. That this has surprised so many people, and yet we don't have any good theory which explains this. And I have to say uh, that every single theory, without exception, I think I'm right in saying, predicts at least some penetrating radiation. So we'll see to what extent, if any, um, uh, the exotic neutral particle theory passes or fails this test. Um, one, a rather old and somewhat established um, theory, uh, I think NASA are very fond of the, the widom larsen theory, and this suggests that uh, in some weird and wonderful way, electrons achieve, uh, acquire some energy, um, they become so-called heavy electrons, they get captured by protons to produce neutrons, and the neutrons, not having any um, charge, can be captured by any components in, in, in the so-called cell and uh, produce transmutation and, of course, excess heat. But as we all know, neutron activation produces a lot of radio radioactivity. And long before we get the necessary 780 keV of uh, of extra energy for an electron, those very same electrons are going to be absorbed by other components, not just protons, they're going to be absorbed by everything as well. We don't observe this. And so the, 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 uh, the criterion of looking for, for or expecting and not finding radioactive um, uh, products is an extremely potent test. OK, I think I've now um, covered that slide. What about Iwamura? We've heard a lot about him over the last 17 years. And I think I can say, without fear of contradiction, that uh, most of the innovations in cold fusion have come from the Iwamura group and the Japanese in general. Um, their first um, uh, proposal was that uh, so-called beryllium-8, beryllium-8 is, is, um, immediately breaks up normally into two helium nuclei. Um, but uh, in, in, some, in some strange way, it represents four uh, deuterons, which can be uh, captured by cesium-133 uh, to produce praseodymium-141. Uh, and praseodymium-141 is not radioactive, and you get a, a very modest 2.8 MeV from the beryllium. And there, there are various other uh, reactions as well. I'm sure uh, um, Fran Francesco Cellani will be telling us about that in due course. I don't know. Will you be telling us about Iwamura's um, reactions? No, Takamashi, Takahashi came afterwards. Iwa, Iwamura was first. Anyway, it it, uh, if, you, if you want to talk about it, that would be a good thing. However, if um, the, the, the mechanism involves some pseudo beryllium-8, we would expect palladium in the first instance to, get, uh, to capture it. And that would produce, at least for two palladium isotopes, radioactive tin. Um, to, to emphasize the radioactivity, I've put r any radioactive isotope in red. Uh, in some cases, though, I know I'll discuss these, um, they don't necessarily produce penetrating radiation. However, these two tin isotopes certainly do, and it would have been extremely obvious and probably produce lethal radiation. Anyway, uh, apart from just palladium, we can, we, can, we can check out what would happen to beryllium-8, and likewise also, uh, though I haven't written it down here, carbon-12, that's to say six deuterons, fusing with a naturally occurring isotope found in nature. 
And the result is, at least for beryllium-8, 70 out of 181 exothermic fusions, that is to say captures, would produce beta radioactivity. That is to say, radioactivity isn't is, you know, is going, to be, going to occur in 35% of the cases, maybe a little bit more than that. We don't see this radioactivity, so that puts a lot of doubt on, into this general kind of mechanism. And of course, you can imagine that if uh, it was an excited state of beryllium-8, as Akito Takahashi would say, um, we would get even more radioactivity. So uh, a, a typical example would be uh, calcium, which um, uh, Iwamura used in his very same um, uh, cesium experiment. There was a, a calcium oxide layer, as I recall. And if that were to, to fuse with beryllium-8 as well, we'd get radioactive chromium-48. But there are countless examples like this. And the third uh, model I want to look at is um, Andrew Muhlenberg's uh, deep Dirac level, sorry, deep Dirac, Dirac level um, model for, uh, for palladium uh, deuteride. And in this particular case, um, an electron gets very close to a deuteron, to effectively neutralizing it, therefore it has no, um, or, or very little Coulomb barrier, I should say little Coulomb barrier. It can then fuse with um, palladium. Um, the electron, um, which, uh, which allowed the, uh, the approach of the, of the nuclei, can then take off all the energy, so we don't get, we suppress any gammas. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but in five cases, we get radioactive silver. Again, we don't observe this. So, as you can see, uh, almost every model, I've taken, I've taken three models, but if anyone wants to cite another model, I can demonstrate probably that it produces um, uh, radioactivity. So do, do challenge me afterwards if you, if, you, if you would like to examine any particular, um, your favorite model on, uh, according to this scheme. So what about these ENPs? Well, as a, as we don't have any evidence really that deuterium is a fuel. Deuterium is this thing here. Um, and I've used um, um, uh, Yuri Bar the late Yuri Barjutov's notation for ertzions, but I'm not suggesting that my ex exotic neutral particles are in fact ertzions. I'm just using them as a generic um, neutral catalyst, and we'll see exactly what these catalysts are capable, are conjectured to be capable of doing. In particular, they, re they, react, they react with um, deuterium and effectively, oops, um, we, we strip a, a neutron off the deuterium to form a, a proton, and we have a, now a slightly heavier um, uh, exotic neutral particle. And so we see that deuterium behaves as a neutron donor. And um, if we just had a, a, a flask of, of heavy water, this is all that would happen. Uh, if, if, if there were a few um, exotic neutral particles around, they would do absolutely nothing. They all pick up a neutron and then stop. Nothing would happen at all, and that's why we don't find cold fusion just happening in a, in, a, in a flask of heavy water. However, such reactions could be extremely fast because there's no Coulomb barrier. Um, we have two products, therefore we can uh, simultaneously conserve uh, um, energy and uh, uh, momentum. Uh, there are no prompt gammas for the same reason, and in this particular case, um, spin is spin and parity are perfectly conserved, so it's a very, very favorable reaction. It's quite possible um, the cross-section could be in the millions of burns. This in turn means the exotic neutral particle could have a very short uh, mean-free path in certain materials. And we'll see later on what the evidence for that is. Um, what we need uh, in order to recycle the, uh, the, um, this particle, which we formed in the previous reaction, back into this, and therefore sustain a chain reaction, we need some neutron acceptors. Um, these are different isotopes. And uh, not, not too surprisingly, um, we find these isotopes quite commonly in, um, in typical uh, cold fusion setups. I would like to draw your attention, rather unusually, to the, the silicon here. Silicon, of course, silica, of course, is a, a very common, common component in glassware. 
and Ubaldo uh, deposits his um, palladium on a silicon substrate, as I recall. And I think, I think the silicon may be participating. The other nice thing about silicon is its most common isotope, 92.3%, is a neutron acceptor. Is a, yes, a neutron acceptor. But also the other isotope, only, only 4%, is a neutron acceptor. So silicon could be a very potent um, fuel for cold fusion. So we need the simultaneous presence of both a donor and an acceptor, and of course the ENPs themselves. But we'll talk about that in a moment. Well, everybody knows that palladium and deuterium are supposed to produce excess heat. So how does that work? Well, palladium isotopes, in fact, the, the same isotope, uh, the 105 isotope, can be acted as both a donor and uh, an acceptor. This is pretty unusual. And we've used some rather modest um, energy here. Uh, none of the products are radioactive. And uh, the, this conjecture is supported by the experimental observation by Zhang and Dash, who noticed increased palladium-104 and 106 and decreased palladium-105. And they presented this at ICCF-13 in um, Sochi in 2007, as I recall. What about lithium? Um, lithium has been used very frequently in the electrolyte. And um, the theory suggests that um, lithium is also is a, a, a neutron donor. And uh, it can be, you can remove a neutron to form um, helium-4, a proton, and uh, create the this entity, and so can lithium-7, but this time we produce no helium. Given that lithium-7 is 92% um, of all lithium, we, expect, we might expect all things being equal, but they're probably not, that uh, this would be the major reaction. And if you calculate what the helium uh, heat ratio would be, it's around 12 MeV, which is not so, so different from the so-called 24 MeV that some people claim. But we'll talk more about that in a moment. And uh, the, the, the clincher, really, is that Piantelli's cloud chamber results showing fast protons and fast alphas um, confirm the rather low energies. I, um, the 4 mev here, or uh, this, that's good. Yeah, just the 4 mev here, because that's divided between a proton and uh, an alpha. And of course, this. And um, this is a. Uh, a photograph, and you can see, uh, this is a cloud chamber photograph, this is a, a, ni a nickel rod here which had been producing excess heat in Piantelli's laboratory, and this is a, a cloud chamber track, probably of a proton, which has hit a nitrogen uh, um, nucleus here, and um, has been um, deflected. This is a straight line, this is a straight line, this is very good evidence of a massive charged particle in the, in the, in the cloud chamber. Uh, um, if you want to know more about this, uh, this experiment, I would refer you to my presentation in Gretscher, which I think is online. Uh, titanium was uh, um, pioneered, the use of titanium was, titanium was pioneered by Scaramuzzi back in 1989, and uh, he loaded um, cold titanium with uh, deuterium gas, and um, Detected neutrons. Well, I can't find any way to produce neutrons, what we'll see in a moment. But certainly, there are some reactions. And uh, these are the three reactions, uh, and it's notable. Once again, we get nothing radioactive. Uh, however, without a donor uh, for, uh, of, of neutrons, we're not going to be able to, to, to do any of those reactions. So one prediction is that titanium hydrogen will do absolutely nothing of, of observable. And I think... Nobody has ever reported titanium and, and proteum doing anything. What about nickel? Nickel hydrogen system is now quite, um, quite famous, or infamous, I might say. Um, here, rather exceptionally, oops, um, we do get nickel 59, which is beta radioactive. Uh, the, only do, uh, the only thing here is 
the, the, the gamma rays from, from nickel 59 are only 10 keV, so they won't penetrate anything at all. You will never be able to measure them unless you took the nickel uh, out and put them close to some X-ray detector. I think it'd be quite difficult. Nobody's done that as far as I know. Nickel 59 also has a very long half-life. Um, offhand, I can't remember what it is, but so I would imagine the gammas would be not only very low energy, but fairly low intensity too. Um, th this is a, a photomicrograph of um, a nic nickel surface. Um, you can see here the, the scale, that's 10 microns, so this is about uh, 100 microns across, maybe a bit more than that, 150. You can just about see this with the naked eye if, you, if you're young and short-sighted, as, as I was in those days. This is from uh, 1996 or 7, I think, in Stromanus' lab. And what we can see here is uh, a globule of metal which has formed some kind of eutectic. Um, again, with the uh, electron micrograph, we could um, identify the eutectic as uh, an alloy of nickel and tin. I mean, we have no idea where the tin came from, but there it is. Uh, and there's no lead, so it wasn't from solder. Um, and it, it, it's, it's formed a very clear... These little granules here are, are typical of what a eutectic will do. The, um, it will try and form an, uh, a more stable alloy, and this will, will solidify separately from the rest of the metal, so, so it produces this strange effect. So that's very good evidence that the temperature there reached 1,000 degrees centigrade. That's rather less than the uh, melting point of nickel, but um, it's still very significant, I think. So what can we conclude about these hotspots? Um, well, Jacques Rouet did a, a, a study on this and presented his results at uh, Toulouse five years ago or so. And um, he suggested that uh, at least 10,000, maybe 100,000 reactions were taking place in a very small area uh, in a rather short time because the conduction of metals is such that any heat from a dozen reactions would just be... Um, uh, conducted away. And um, the reason why this is so important uh, is it demonstrates there can be no nuclear active site and there can be no coherence either because if you melt something, you destroy any, any fragile chemical structures. So again, this is all good evidence for um, exotic neutral particles being responsible. And again and again, especially with the, the old hands in this field, we talk about the, uh, the heat to helium ratio, which notionally is um, produced by a reaction such as this. But to, in, 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 the, in, in 2020, I don't think a single um, uh, cold fusion model pretends that this reaction actually occurs. And even if it does, they, they also propose many other reactions occur. So we can only say that if the 23 point, let's say 24, 25 MeV energy is in fact observed, it's purely a coincidence. It has nothing to do with any one particular reaction because there are multiple reactions. Okay, what about detecting... Um, uh, uh, as exotic neutral particles. I'm, I'm stimulated to write this slide because you, you, one of your questions about 15 years ago, Obaldo, you, said, you asked me, why don't we detect them? And I had no idea what to say. <laughs> but since then, I've been adding more and more uh, ways of detecting. And uh, lo and behold, all the ways of detecting them are with neutron detectors, even though, and this, is, this requires emphasis, the reactions which take place in the neutron detector are different from the reactions which take place with neutrons. So, um, within a helium-3 detector, for example, we can produce two protons, whereas a neutron with helium-3 produces tritium, quite different. Uh, similarly, we can produce helium-4 directly uh, with, 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 the, with the other exotic neutral particle. In other words, we can detect both particles with helium-3. And exactly the same logic applies to, to boron. But this time, we're going to produce some boron-9, 
which decays by proton emission to, to beryllium-8, which decays in turn to two alphas. And, we, and we, we, we can measure helium, of course. No, the, the, the detectors are, are working perfectly, but they're not detecting neutrons. They're detecting something else. So, uh, uh, actually, I, I presented these results three years ago, with the exception of this last um, line here about gold, because I was a bit worried that Piantelli had, had used gold to detect neutrons, and he uh, calculated that uh, he, he could get uh, 10,000 neutrons a second from nickel and hydrogen, but of course, there's no theory which makes that prediction. And this has always bothered me. And then I realized that um, we could still activate gold. In, 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 in the neutron case, though, this would be gold 198, not 196. But nevertheless, if you, if you, if you are a, a bit sloppy about your, 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 your gamma ray detection and you don't measure the energy properly, you, you could be measuring 196 instead of 198. I think for the purposes of this argument, it doesn't make any difference. It's quite likely that iron will work as well. In fact, I'm quite sure it will. And now we're going to come to the controversial bit, because, as I say, I have difficulty, and I think most theories have difficulty, explaining why we get neutrons from, from light hydrogen. So I'm going to, I'm going to claim... That's okay. Where am I? Okay. Um, so I'm going to claim that um, uh, the neutrons are in fact ENPs, and tr the tritium which has been measured, again, that's another problem for light hydrogen systems, is in fact carbon-14. It's been misidentified. Um, the reason why I, I don't like um, tritium is if it were formed at any kinetic energy, by whatever model, um, it would produce 14.1 mev neutrons by, by uh, interacting with any deuterium present. So, uh, at least in deuterium deuterated systems, we don't see these 40.1 um, mev uh, neutrons, despite uh, falsely in his, um, in his group's results. I think I better move on now. So, I'm, I'm saying that uh, it's probably going to be carbon 14, which is both a donor and, a, um, and an acceptor isotope. And maybe Alan will have something to say about carbon. I don't know if he asked the question. Uh, but the most important evidence of all is the um, rubidium evidence. Um, Bush and Eagleton, back in 1993 or so, um, uh, um, found excess heat in the electrolysis of rubidium carbonate with a nickel cathode and a, and a platinum anode. And um, they could, although they had a, a sodium iodide uh, mass, um, gamma spectrometer, it was, not, uh, had, it was very low resolution. Um, they probably had some other radioactive stuff present as well, and maybe there was a, some sedimentation uh, of, of the product over, over, uh, over weeks when they were measuring it, and so on and so forth. So it wasn't a very clear experiment, but they did get millions of, um, of counts, millions of counts per day, I should say, maybe 10 million over, over a week or something like that. That's, that's quite a lot of radioactivity, and I... Um, suggest it's caused by this reaction, which Bush and Eagleton did not identify. Um, the rubidium-86 has a, a half-life of uh, 16 days, which is comparable to what they measured. So in, in, it, it seems to, to tally. Um, again, this is another uh, reaction which I mentioned uh, three years ago at the, uh, the ASTI workshop. Uh, but in those days, I had absolutely no evidence whatsoever that chlorine-36 could be a product. And then just um, three or four months ago, I wrote to Mel Miles, whom I, know, I knew had, had, had done electrolysis of um, ammonium chloride, I think it was, and um, he said, yes, yes, um, we had very high Geiger counter counts. Why he didn't actually measure the, the gammas, I don't know, but uh, certainly... Um, uh, there's an explanation for this, which would be the decay of chlorine-36. 
Unfortunately, chlorine 36 has um, a 301,000 year half life, and very few of the decays actually produce, and less than 0.03%, actually produce these gammas. Nevertheless, the signal should be very clear, and so this is something which needs to be repeated. So, in, in summary, uh, you need a donor, an acceptor, and a source of exotic neutral particles. We don't know enough about the properties of these exotic not neutral particles quite yet, but uh, the fact that uh, cold fusion usually occurs in paramagnetic transition metals suggests that, that some, mag some magnetic property might be, um, might be relevant. So, um, I think I've, I can stop here and say that uh, Elements such as lithium, carbon, sulfur, titanium, nickel, palladium, tungsten, platinum can all support uh, um, cold, cold nuclear fusion. No, we don't call it that. Um, anomalous heat. Rubidium and chlorine uh, explain uh, the, the radioactivity we do, uh, we do, do find. The importance of spin and parity needs to be further studied. But I think this theory explains the vast majority of, of what we observe. Thank you. Thank you very much. There is time for a few questions. Luca. Bill, can you go back uh, to the slide uh, regarding the tritium? Here, some of the slides. You, yes, well. you said no bottle can explain neutron production in light hydrogen systems. Tomorrow, I will show you, both theoretically and experimentally, this this can be done. Uh, I, 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 I believe experimentally it can be shown. And theoretically, I, I, I will I, I, show I can, you. I, I can uh, answer that. I have answered that. I will show you. Other questions? No questions, so thank you very much again, Bill. Ah, another, another question? Actually, I believe that uh, this uh, hypothetical particle you are uh, talking about, maybe, we talked uh, about this uh, yesterday evening, uh, maybe it is a, a coherent uh, superposition of many, uh, of a multiple uh, number of uh, neutrons in a coherent state. I will, show, I will talk about that tomorrow. Okay. The, the, as I also explained last night, I think the reason why I don't accept that immediately, we need to talk more, of course, is that um, in order to, to capture one of these neutrons, um, we need, to, we need to, to give some energy some, to somewhere, and we need to give an energy of about eight, eight, eight mev or something like that. <laughs> so, in other yes. words, we, ha we have to pay back a debt. And yes, I, I will show you tomorrow. Only, only the very highest energy Neutron captures are going to be of interest because we have to pay it, we have to pay a debt back to the system. Now, if you had yes, a, but a, a you, all, you always talk about one single particle. Okay. We, you should not. We all should stop thinking about single particle dynamics of single particles okay. and instead start talking about wa uh, matter waves, matter waves, coherent matter waves. Okay. Can we talk about yes, tomorrow. Great. Okay. Pausa. E quindi? Devo presentare io? Va bene. Bene, 
È il mio turno? Eh, Alan, sì, Ubaldo, scusa. I, I, I will speak a little bit okay. in English, just for you. But you can, uh, you can go, I will wait for you. Ok. okay. Perché Alan è interessato, <ride> perché è lui che mi ha dato il materiale da provare nel reattore, quindi non vorrei eh, escluderlo dalla presentazione. Beh, intanto posso andare alla prima slide. <ride> no, la presentazione è molto semplice, non ci sono molte eh, parole scritte, sono soltanto dei, dei grafici che riguardano appunto una serie di esperimenti eh, nel tentativo di replicare eh, i risultati ottenuti da Mizuno con un suo reattore che lui ha chiamato R20. E Alan mi ha potuto procurare del materiale, eh, non so se lo stesso dello stesso lotto usato da Mizuno, ma simile a quello di Mizuno. Quindi sono delle mesh di nickel sulle quali è stato depositato per strofinamento e per rubbing, come dicono in inglese, giusto Bill, del palladio partendo da un blocchettino di palladio. E e eh, questo materiale è stato messo dentro il reattore e adesso vi mostrerò gli esperimenti fatti con vari, eh, vari tipi di gas. Dunque. Okay. Questo è il, lo, il setup sperimentale. Eh, il reattore R20... Eh, eh, Alan, can you follow me in Italian? If you, I will uh, specify in English something that uh, may be for your interest. Il Esperiment, uh, setup sperimentale prevede appunto il reattore con all'interno il materiale, adesso vi farò vedere come è stato posizionato al suo interno, eh, per verificare eventuali produzioni di radiazione c'è un gamma detector, a ioduro di sodio e, e un rivelatore di neutroni, un neutron detector eh, ad elio 3, è la boccia sotto che vede indicata con la freccia verde, e gli, gli altri sono le interfacce per avere il dato di, eh, di rivelazione dei, della radiazione sul PC e poi c'è una termocoppia K applicata all'esterno del reattore. Qui si vede soltanto il connettore, non si vede bene la posizione della termocoppia K, comunque è attaccata al reattore per mezzo di due collarini che sono fatti di filo di nickel per tenerla stretta, ben aderente al reattore in modo da avere una misura stabile della temperatura. L'interno del reattore, in una prima fase, prevedeva la mesh esattamente messa all'interno della parete del reattore, come Mizuno, ma questa prova l'avevamo fatta con un altro reattore, quello che avevo, avevamo portato a ICCF22. Vi ricordate che Argal aveva portato un reattore che però non aveva funzionato a dovere, in quanto non si riusciva ad avere un vuoto sufficientemente buono al suo interno e quindi diciamo, le, le, gli esperimenti erano eh, risultati falsati. Inoltre non si riusciva ad ottenere una temperatura del reattore come quelle previste dal protocollo di Mizuno. E quindi eh, è stata effettuata una modifica eh, per mettere il materiale all'interno del reattore. Vedete che il riscaldatore, the heater, è, è, è molto sottile, it's very thin heater, it's uh, six 
50 watts uh, heater e, e con questo mettendo, facendo il test del comportamento termico del reattore cioè testing the reactor just to see uh, if we were able to go up in temperature uh, up to 300 degrees uh, we, we failed so uh, we changed the, the internal configuration. Uh, ritornerò su questa slide. La slide successiva è il modello uh, termico del reattore. Questo permette di interpretare i dati dal punto di vista delle misure delle temperature, sia quella interna che quella esterna. In realtà questo modello riguarda soltanto la parte relativa alle mesh. In realtà, come avete visto, eh, per tornare indietro come si fa? Così. Come avete visto, il riscaldatore nella configurazione di questi esperimenti sporge dal, dal, dal supporto delle mesh, che è un tubo di acciaio più piccolo del reattore. Questo lo vedremo, eh, il motivo di questo lo vedremo tra, tra un attimo. Quindi il modello, il, questo modello qui riguarda soltanto la parte delle mesh. In realtà esiste un modello più complesso che comprende anche la parte del riscaldatore che va a riscaldare il reattore direttamente senza attraversare il materiale. Eh, queste due curve eh, mostrano l'andamento della temperatura del reattore senza il materiale dentro, soltanto con il riscaldatore. This uh, graph shows how uh, is the trend of the reactor temperature correlated to the internal power without the material. This was done just to test the behavior of uh, the heater and the reactor. Si vede che la curva verde, the green uh, path, the green uh, curve, shows the temperature of the reactor uh, with the power. You can see that you cannot exceed 100 degrees centigrade. Non si riesce a salire di più di 100 gradi con una potenza di 100 watt. E nel grafico sotto vedete che con, con 100 watt la temperatura del riscaldatore, misurata con la termocoppia, è di 540 gradi. Quindi all'interno non, non si riesce ad andare molto in alto con la temperatura del riscaldatore per avere le temperature del reattore eh, vicine a quelle di Mizuno. Quindi, tornando indietro... Adesso la pressione la, la faccio vedere. Adesso vediamo le pressioni all'interno, sono state fatte tutte le misure del caso. E allora vedete che per ovviare all'inconveniente del raggiungimento della temperatura della mesh, almeno su uno, fino a 300 gradi, è stato modificato il riscaldatore, the heater has been modified to have the mesh closer to the, to the heater, to have the mesh at a quite high temperature like uh, Mizuno. E il, quel cilindro di acciaio is a stainless steel cylinder with a wand all around the, the mesh. The mesh is uh, blocked with a, a nickel wire. Ok. Eh, la flangia del reattore 
eh, la frangia fr frontale dove c'è il riscaldatore ha le connessioni naturalmente per il riscaldamento, per eh, il vuoto e l'immissione dei gas e eh, per la misura della temperatura con una termocoppia K interna che nella taratura del reattore misurava la temperatura del riscaldatore. Invece negli esperimenti che farò vedere misura la temperatura della mesh. Okay? La termocoppia K è posizionata, è legata diciamo, alla mesh con un filo eh, metallico per misurare la temperatura della mesh. Questo è il modello che se voi fate una simulazione elettronica di questo modello si vedono esattamente le curve se applicate uno step al generatore di potenza, uno step, come faccio io col computer che porto la, eh, la potenza a 20 watt, a 30 watt e aspetto che si stabilizzi il sistema. Se voi simulate questo circuito qui, si comporta esattamente come eh, l'esperimento, dando i giusti valori naturalmente alle capacità e alle resistenze che non sono fisse, eh, sono variabili, per effetto della temperatura. Ecco, questa è la tabella che permette l'analisi la, dei risultati dei vari esperimenti. In questo caso, diciamo, c'è un esperimento, non è indicato il gas che c'è dentro, ma la pressione, vedete lì, è di 20 millibar, 20,1, la pressione iniziale, 20,1, i parametri misurati sono la potenza in ingresso, la temperatura della mesh, la temperatura della, eh, del reattore, TC è la temperatura del reattore, TC is the, the reactor temperature, external temperature, TA is the environment temperature, eh, pressure, la pressione, eh, la tensione, ok, non ha importanza, è importante la potenza. Poi la, la pressione normalizzata per avere riferimento tra i vari esperimenti che non tutti sono alla identica pressione iniziale. Poi abbiamo la differenza di temperatura tra la, il reattore e la temperatura ambiente e deve essere sempre tenuta in conto la temperatura della mesh meno la temperatura della camera, quindi la caduta sulla resistenza interna del modello che abbiamo visto prima e poi la misura della RTH sia della mesh che del reattore che sono la derivata praticamente delle curve della salita della temperatura della mesh e della temperatura della camera che sono più sensibili rispetto alla misura assoluta della temperatura. Eh, questo, in questo grafico in this graph, we can see the behavior of the pressure inside the reactor with different gases. Con differenti gas sono stati fatti, eh, sono stati fatti i test, sono stati fatti una decina di, di test con gas differenti e pressioni differenti. In questo caso sono state messe a confronto, in this case we compared different gases at uh, similar pressure. 20 millitor was the starting pressure. Eh, vedete che c'è una curva che si scosta dalle altre. È la curva eh, dell'idrogeno. Le altre quattro curve sono del deuterio e del eh, elio. Deuterio e elio hanno la stessa massa circa, no? E quindi il comportamento della, della pressione all'interno del reattore è comprensibile che sia molto simile. Comunque anche l'idrogeno a 20 millibar si comporta come gli altri gas, praticamente sono quasi dei gas perfetti all'interno del volume del reattore che è abbastanza grande. Quel decremento della pressione del, eh, dell'idrogeno durante la salita in potenza indica che c'è stato un assorbimento e l'assorbimento, come vedete, eh, inizia a una potenza intorno ai 20 watt, 
dove la temperatura è ancora relativamente bassa. Si, si ha un assorbimento dalla parte, di, da parte della mesh, che è quasi tutto nickel esposto all'ambiente, con 20 millibar nel reattore, anche un assorbimento modesto da parte del nickel si, si riesce a misurare. Cioè quella instabilità? Quelli lì sono le incertezze della misura della potenza, purtroppo, perché eh, su questo esperimento eh, il controllo della potenza è stato fatto eh, in maniera manuale e quindi non è molto preciso, non è molto preciso, è, è abbastanza preciso, vedi? vabbè, dopo vedremo meglio. Ecco, questa è la, forse la curva più interessante che riguarda la, il comportamento del reattore. This is the most interesting <laughs> uh, graph I obtained in these uh, experiments. Sono sei esperimenti, due esperimenti di taratura, two, uh, two experiments, two tests for calibration with helium inside the reactor. E le, le curve dell'elio si sovrappongono perfettamente, quasi perfettamente. Le curve dell'elio sono quella verde e quell'altra celestino. Elio, tutti intorno ai 20 millibar. Eh, le due curve in alto, come vedete, fino a una certa potenza, usando il deuterio, using deuterium, up a certain power, power in, uh, the curve overlap, overlap the, the calibration. And at a certain point, uh, the, the, the yellow curve uh, is going at higher temperatures uh, uh, respect to the, the, the calibration. And Also, the other deuterium 20 millibar uh, test shows uh, a deviation from the calibration. Uh, uh, the red uh, curve, la curva rossa, è l'idrogeno, che vedete ha un comportamento un po' strano. E mi sarei aspettato che si sovrapponesse a quelle della calibrazione. In realtà si sovrappone a quelle della calibrazione soltanto alla fine. E cioè, non so, diciamo, non so spiegare. Questo qui però riguarda la temperatura della mesh. Eh, se sembrerebbe da queste curve che ci sia stato un eccesso un eccesso di, di potenza, perché se facciamo la differenza di potenza a pari temperatura, vedete che ci sono qualche decina di watt di differenza tra la calibrazione e la, le curve col deuterio a 20 millibar. Ma questo... Uh, uh, it may seem that there is some extra power generation due to the uh, difference in temperature at the same power between deuterium and helium. Ma questo deve essere confermato dalla temperatura del reattore, dall'andamento della temperatura del reattore, per essere, se fosse stato confermato, avremmo potuto dire che eh, realmente c'è stato un incremento di potenza, ma queste sono le curve della temperatura del reattore rispetto alla potenza con gli stessi, durante gli stessi test e si vede che diciamo, le curve praticamente si sovrappongono eh, diciamo, a parte gli errori di misura dovuti anche al fatto che la potenza è stata misurata manualmente. Se qui ci fossero state le curve del deuterio che si fossero distanziate da quelle della, 
della calibrazione avremmo potuto dire che c'era stato effettivamente un, un eccesso di energia. A me rimane il dubbio, siccome il modello che ho fatto vedere prima riguarda soltanto le mesh, diciamo in questo caso la temperatura del reattore è affetta anche dalla parte di potenza che il riscaldatore manda direttamente al reattore. Quindi diciamo che la temperatura del reattore è meno sensibile a eventuale eccesso di potenza. Ripeto per inglese se ci riesco per, per Alan. Uh, if we uh, uh, consider the, uh, the equivalent, the, uh, the therm Uh, the thermal model of the, the reactor, the model represents only the mesh inside the reactor. But this temperature has to uh, take in, into account also the power that goes directly to the reactor without flowing it through the mesh. So this uh, test is uh, this uh, uh, measurement is less sensitive respect to an, uh, a possible excess heat. But I, I think that okay, that uh, uh, there was no excess heat to be uh, prudent. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, I made uh, also tests at higher pressure and you can see here that we have, uh, uh, this is the, uh, the mesh temperature, è la temperatura delle mesh rispetto al reattore dove si vede che la curva dell'idrogeno a 580 millibar si stacca dalle curve intorno ai 300 millibar sia del deuterio eh, no, sia dell'elio che dell'idrogeno quindi sembrerebbe che l'idrogeno a più alta pressione eh, abbia prodotto qualcosa ma anche qui se andiamo a vedere le stesse curve eh, che riguardano la temperatura del reattore rispetto alla temperatura ambiente vediamo che le curve praticamente si sovrappongono e quindi quella impressione di eccesso di calore del grafico precedente potrebbe essere dovuta al fatto che è l'unico test fatto a 580 millibar di idrogeno mentre gli altri erano a 300 millibar quindi erano più confrontabili e questo sta a dimostrare che c'è una certa sensibilità eh, dei test alla pressione interna. Noi non possiamo, we cannot compare tests done at 300 millibar with uh, all the tests done at 20 millibar. There is no possibility to overlap, <laughs> to adjust the curve to have a uniformity. We cannot, uh, we are not able to normalize the behavior. Ok, thank you for the attention. That's all. Ok, grazie. E, niente, siamo un po' stretti coi tempi, mi sembra di capire, quindi facciamo dopo le domande e, e quindi facciamo lo stop. Se non c'è, non le facciamo. Io in realtà ce ne avrei, ne avrei un paio, però sì. le, facciamo dopo. le facciamo dopo, sì. Ok, allora, coffee break.